is in his paper on Shakespeare. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and good morning. My name is Addison Cook, and today I will be presenting my paper on the consequences of vengeance in William Shakespeare's Titus and John. Um, this paper was written for the um, English 219 Harvard Literature class in the fall of 2018, and the core of the class focused on how the body relates to literature. And so, uh, going with that, I like to focus on the aspects of behavior. And so, this paper shows the more mental aspects of the characters and their motivations. So, with that being said, I will now read my paper. The desire for vengeance is a base human desire that all people possess. When an event occurs where an individual is emotionally or physically hurt, there are a flood of emotions released in the it is possible that an individual would then want to retaliate against the perpetrator of the offense so that they might get what they perceive as justice. However, sometimes the pursuit of vengeance causes awful consequences. Titus Andronicus by William Shakespeare utilizes vengeance and the consequences of the search for it as a central motif. The main characters of Titus Andronicus and Tamora are both driven by their hatred for each other. Vengeance in this play is cyclical in nature, that is, once the first act of vengeance is committed, acts of vengeance are continually repeated until both Titus and Tamora are dead. In the end, this cycle leads to the complete destruction of their families. By telling the tragic tale of these two families, Shakespeare illustrates that vengeance only has self-destructive tendencies. Vengeance is first seen as a motivating force for Tamora. In the very beginning of the play, Tamora's eldest son is murdered in a ritual sacrifice that is condoned by Titus. She says, Let me alone. Or she says, quote, let me alone. I'll find a day to massacre them all and raise their faction and family, the cruel father and his traitor sons, to whom I sued for my dear son's life. Here, Tamora has just been through an extremely traumatic event. Her firstborn son has been ritually sacrificed to appease the gods of a foreign people. As illustrated in lines 499 through 503, she vows revenge against the enabler of this sacrifice, Titus Andronicus. It is important to note that at this point, um, Titus Andronicus is not seeking revenge against Tamora, and he only allows the, the, the alarmist to be sacrificed because he feels it is his duty to roam. Despite his intentions, his decision still causes great pain for Tamora. Her response is to immediately seek retribution. Titus passively condemned the death of her son, so when presented with the opportunity, Tamora returns the favor. Her sons, after being persuaded by her lover, Aaron, kill Titus' son-in-law and then ask their mother for her blessing to rape Lavinia, Titus' daughter. Tamora happily gives it and sends them off, saying, Remember, boys, I poured forth tears in vain to save your brother from the sacrifice. But fierce Andronicus would not relent. Therefore, away with her, and use her as you will. The worse to her, the better love to me. Lines 903 through 907. Tamora explicitly tells Lavinia that she is only being raped because of Titus' lack of mercy. The fact that Titus only allowed the sacrifice out of customary reasons and not for vengeance is either not known by Tamora or, more likely, ignored by her. She fails to realize that Titus has not yet come to want her and her son's dead. She also does not realize that the rape and mutilation of Lavinia would be the event that actuates Titus's hatred of her and her family. This sequence of events is the first instance of Shakespeare showing us the cyclical nature of revenge. We have an event, a largest death, that sets in motion the wheels of hatred in Tamora's mind. She responds to this event by returning the favor to Titus when she condones the rape and mutilation of Lavinia. What she does is she reduces Lavinia to a cog in the machine of revenge. She weaponizes her by using Titus' love of Lavinia to hurt him. The conclusion could be made that this presents a sexist overtone. Here, Lavinia is being forced into a position where she is being reduced to a means to hurt her father. Tamor could care less about Lavinia's feelings. All she, care about is, all she cares about is how much Lavinia's rape hurts her. Or it's Titus, excuse me. In her essay titled The Traffic of Women, Notes on the Political Economy of Sex, Gail Rubin introduces the theory of a sex-slash-gender system where women are the products of a male-controlled economy of sex. She cites arranged marriage practices where a woman's right to choose a marital partner is eliminated and given to her father. The father then chooses a suitor for his daughter that will best advance his role in the community, whether through economic or social needs. She says of these systems, the exchange of women is a profound perception of a system in which women do not have full rights to themselves. She's essentially saying that those in power have control over the decisions made or of a decision involving those who are subjected to the system, and will use this power without consideration to those being used as pawns in their game. Tamora uses this same principle to deny Lavinia a choice in her participation in the revenge cycle, and forces her to become a part of it. The only difference between the system Ruben discusses and the system in Titus Andronicus is the gender of those who are oppressing. Nonetheless, the systems still have the same goal. 
achieving the wants of those who are in power through the exploitation of another individual. This step in the cycle not only throws Lavinia into the system, but it also brings in her father, Titus, as well. Throughout the play, Titus is portrayed as a strong and ideal Roman citizen. In his critical analysis of Titus Andronicus, Robert S. Miola writes of this, on the subject of Titus' Stoicism and strict adherence to Roman law, stating, Shakespeare carefully illustrates the operation of this code in the opening funeral march. Titus does not weep tears of sorrow for his dead sons, but tears of joy for his return to Rome. So completely does he try to identify personal and civil welfare that the monopoly of public triumph, theoretically at least, subsumes all private grief. This selection supports the notion that Titus is first and foremost a Roman general and a father second. He has dedicated his life to his family and to Rome. He has gone as far as taking his own sons into battle where the majority of them die. Even in the face of these seemingly great losses, Titus does not seem to be very grief. However, when he first sees Lavinia, Titus is immediately overcome with grief and fits of tears. Perhaps Titus is more shocked when he sees Lavinia because of her innocence. Perhaps it is because the nature of the attack is more horrific. A myriad of questions and combinations of rage and sorrow have to be traveling through his mind at this point. And it is no surprise then that once Lavinia managed to communicate what exactly happened to her and who did it, that his range would be untethered, knowing no bounds. This is exactly what happens. The rage and grief inflicted by Timur causes Titus to transform from a stoic Roman general to a vengeful murderer. Titus' rage is best showcased with the following quote. quote this one hand yet is left to cut your throats. Whilst that Lavinia between her stumps doth hold that the basin that receives your guilty blood, you know your mother means to feast with me, and calls herself revenge, and thinks me mad. Hark, villains, I will grind your bones to dust, and with your blood, and it, I will make a paste. And of the paste a coffin I will rear, and make two pastries of your shameful heads, and bid that strumpet your unhallowed hand, like to the earth, swallow her own in Greece. This is the feast that I have bid her to, and this the banquet she shall serve her upon. Excuse me. This, this speech that um, Titus is actually telling um, Tamora's two sons as they are hanging upside down and he is um, about to kill them, it, it perfectly showcases the pin of aggression that's been building up in Titus since he first saw him. He has plotted and executed the first part of his revenge plan, and um, it, it is a little bit unclear. However, what he plans to do is he plans to feed Tamora's own sons to her in a feast. And that, that is his revenge plan. And now that he has the people responsible for his sorrows, Titus Andronicus no longer restrains himself. He says he is going to serve them up at his feast, and this is exactly what he does. He serves them to his guests. Tamora eats part of the meat pie, and then Titus reveals his plot, stabs Tamora, thereby completing his vendetta against the barbarous gods. This part of the revenge cycle finishes off the saga of violence and mayhem that has characterized the story. Shakespeare has demonstrated in this last scene the final consequences of the pursuit of vengeance. Ultimately, the pursuit of vengeance is completely corrupting, as one can never be satisfied completely with the revenge they have gotten. Both Titus and Tamor were searching for justice for the wrongs done at each other's hands. Despite all the acts of violence committed at their behest, nothing proved satisfactory. Their inability to be satisfied urges them to continue, the, to continue their pursuit. The most drastic changes are seen in Titus. In the beginning of the play, Titus is well respected comfort, and is desired by the Roman people to be their next emperor. And over the course of the play, Titus goes from being a wise and measured person to a deranged murderer. All of his development is caused by the actions of Tamora and her children. They directly cause the madness that overcomes them in the final act of the play. In the end, both Titus and Tamora refuse to be outdone one another in their pursuit of vengeance. They were seemingly locked in a com competition to determine who could harm whose children the most. For Titus, the changes he undergoes. Wait, excuse me. The fact that Titus is fellow. Wait, my apologies. In contrast, Tamora's initial moral standings are less clear, and her initial plea for a largest life, she did not seem to hold anything against Titus. Her hatred for him appears to have developed directly after he makes the decision to sacrifice her son. Titus' quest for vengeance begins only after he sees Lavinia following her mutilation. Both Titus and Tamora's pursuits of revenge result in the destruction of their families. The upshot of all this violence and mayhem is the fact that revenge and the pursuit of it are wholly corrupted. The old adage, violence begets violence, rings true. Thank you. <clears throat>